thanks for tuning in to watch the video today. Uh, I'm going to spend about the next 20 minutes or so going over what we call the retire smarter solution. Everybody's purchased a car in their lifetime or a house. You know, these things are very concrete. You can go, you can look inside the house, you can drive the car, kick the tires, and you can make an informed decision. Whenever you're looking to hire a professional, uh, be it a doctor, accountant, financial advisor, what have you, you're really buying the wisdom knowledge, expertise, and process that that professional follows. So it's somewhat abstract. What I'm hoping to do is really walk you through and make this financial planning process more concrete, whether you're working with an advisor or doing this yourself or potentially looking for a new advisor. Uh, these are the things that we feel are very important to help make sure that you make smart decisions and make the most out of what you have. Before I get into uh, the topic, just a little bit about us and, and perhaps why you should even you know listen to me. Um, We've been in business since 2007. Uh, I'm the founder of True Wealth Design and I'm a certified financial planner as are all of our six professionals that we currently have, be it a CFP, CPA, or a chartered financial analyst. Very credentialed, experienced, and educated professionals. We serve more than 350 clients and manage more than $430 million on their behalf. We take care of their planning, their investing, and their taxes, both planning as well as preparation on a year in and year out basis. A few things that make us different, uh, we really strive to have a proactive relationship. You set expectations, this is when we're gonna be reaching out, this is the work that we need to be doing at that point in time, and then we actually reach out and do it. It's kind of like going to the dentist in a way and making sure that you know, you're coming back every six months for your checkup. Um, we have the ability to go ahead and integrate your retirement planning, your investment planning, as well as your tax and estate planning into a cohesive strategy. So we have quite a depth of expertise here and we really look to give a lot of value for the fee that our clients pay us. All advisors, as I mentioned, are highly credentialed. And I think importantly too, the beliefs that we have are all science-based, empirically proven, time-tested, both investing-wise as well as planning. And I'll touch on some of that today. And of course, you know, everything needs to be very transparent. Uh, the fees that clients pay us are, are very straightforward. You know, you do better, we do better. It's very transparent and win-win. No commissions on any investment product recommendations, which is very important. Our clients are happy. Um, so we do a blind survey every few years. Uh, this is the results. Uh, these are the results from our most recent one. Uh, this is something called an NPS score. You probably uh, have participated in, even if you're not sure what it is. But in short, all that it does and all that we did in October of 21 was in a blind uh, format, ask our clients, would you recommend your advisor? And uh, that's on a scale of one to 10. With the nines and the tens, you count it as a plus one. If you have a seven or an eight, you throw that score out. Six or below, you get a negative one. Uh, and you go through that process and you tally it up and you can see our NPS scores are there and are quite a bit above uh, the average wealth management firm in the industry. To give you uh, an idea, the Ritz-Carlton, not saying that we're the Ritz, but generally scores in the high 70s are around 80 and you know they're known for great experience, service and satisfaction. So this is what our clients say. The vast majority of Fortune 1000 firms actually use a similar sort of process to go ahead and measure their client satisfaction, as do we. And candidly, I think this is probably the best metric to go ahead and evaluate somebody. So if you know somebody that is already working with us, certainly speaking to them about their experience is great. But this is what our clients have said in an anonymous blind survey, uh, and our results have been consistent over time. So we're very proud of that, and we're always working forward to be even better. All right, enough about us, and let's talk about this retire smarter solution. I'll kind of uh, make an analogy here, but suppose you're going to have surgery. It's maybe something pretty significant, um, and you're going in and you're talking to a doctor, or actually you're analyzing or reviewing some doctors to potentially work with. You're probably going to want somebody that's board certified, that is highly experienced in working with people like you. Uh, has a lot of successful outcomes, hopefully has a good bedside manner to boot. You know, you're not going to go in with somebody that is kind of exploratory surgery that doesn't have experience or has, you know, disparate outcomes. At least I wouldn't. That's really what we're looking at here. It's really a six-step process to organize all the, the intricacies of your financial life, bring everything together to support who you are and what you want to do, make that transition from work into retirement, and make sure that you stay on path. All right, step one. 
the retirement visualizer. So a lot of times people have a reasonably decent idea of what they spend, uh, and sometimes they don't. You know, when you think of this for yourself and your family, most of our clients, uh, as they've continued to climb the ladder over time, their incomes uh, increase and their spending may increase somewhat. Their lifestyle may increase somewhat, but generally they're saving more than they're spending. And they find that they don't have to worry about money. And a lot of times they stop tracking, you know, really what their budget is and you just don't have to worry about it. But when you're getting ready uh, to go ahead and turn off your paycheck and live on the assets and the resources that you've accumulated over time, it's incredibly important to know what you're spending. So even if you're not sure you know, what you're spending, we can still start the process and get the ball rolling. And you'll see when we get to step two that it's really important to measure what it, in fact your lifestyle does cost. But nonetheless, in step one, um, we want to pull together everything that you have, you know, your 401k, if you have a joint account or trust account, the cash that you have, if you did accumulate any sort of social security or pension benefit, and just start evaluating what your sustainable spending is going to be. We can go ahead and massage this into some different spending goals, and then we can take those financial assets, those investment assets, and then anything that's not being met by your retirement income obviously has to be met from your savings and your investments, and we can start stress testing that to evaluate your sustainable spending. Very, very important. At least it provides a framework for what's possible, even if we don't have detailed information as far as what you're spending actually is today. Step two, and again, if you have good data already, if you know what you're spending, you know, that's great. But if you don't, again, we can start the process and get the ball rolling and kind of do that. I call it a retirement pre-approval number for spending in step one. But in step two, we like to call it the lifestyle analyzer. Really, it's measuring you know, what your current lifestyle spending is. It's also going ahead and creating and ranking your retirement spending goals. So think of it this way. You know, you have some needs, you know, your heat in the house, air conditioning in the summer, food in the belly, pay your property taxes, so on and so forth. All these things that we have to do as long as we're on this planet. And then you may have some more discretionary items, maybe, you know, your car purchases, for example. I say it's a little bit more discretionary because, you know, you can hold on to a vehicle a little bit longer or not. You can trade in for something new. You can buy something, maybe pre-owned. You have more flexibility there. You could also have some travel goals that, hey, these are things that we would really like to do. But, you know, candidly, they're not core to our existence. So there may be a little bit more discretionary in the ones category. These are all value-based decisions that you make. It's our job to make it very clear and concrete, measure your lifestyle, and then categorize the expenses into these different rank categories, be it needs, wants, or the most discretionary wishes, which may be a little bit more aspirational. But again, everybody's different. So what may be a want for you, candidly, may be a need for somebody else. It's our job to figure that out, ask those questions, and make sure that you, know, you are categorizing these expenses in a very meaningful way to you. And then on top of that, we really need to factor in age-related spending changes. Most people don't know this, but the retirement research clearly shows that people tend to spend less as they age over time and real terms. So what real terms means is basically on inflation adjusted terms. So your lifestyle uh, the year before that you retire is likely to be pretty darn similar to what your lifestyle is going to be the first year in retirement. Sure, there may be some things that you want to do. Take that big trip. You know, maybe it's buying a second home or what have you, but your core lifestyle really is going to be quite consistent by and large uh, for the most part. So you've become accustomed to spending in a certain way over the prior years and decades for that matter. And so those, those behaviors really become ingrained. Sure, when you have more time, when you're not working, there may be things that you want to add to that lifestyle if you can. There's also going to be some things that fall off. It may be if you're not commuting or if you don't have to buy professional dress clothes or whatever the case may be. But really measuring your current lifestyle and then making some smart adjustments for whatever makes sense in your specific situation is very important. And when you factor in that age-related spending changes, basically, and, and I think this is pretty common sense when you think about it, but a lot of people fall short of utilizing in their financial plan. The 60s are the go-go years, the 70s are the slow-go years, the 80s are the no-go years. And candidly, those keeps getting pushed back as we keep having some increased longevity and people are healthier at later ages. So, you know, who knows? Nobody can predict the future, but that tends to be very clear evidence on how people change on average. 
and the fact is they do slow down. Their spending continues to decline over time. You may be thinking, but oh wait, what about healthcare? And yes, healthcare definitely tends to increase at the later stages of life. However, those higher healthcare expenditures disproportionately are for some very sick people, um, and they can be quite costly. Uh, so whether that is you know, something that is likely to happen to you, sure, we can consider some family history and more recent experience. But again, we can't predict the future. So, you know, in general, just to put a bow on it, spending declines as you age. That's just how retirement spending tends to be. Your first year of spending in retirement is probably going to be pretty darn similar to what your last year of working is. So it's really important to measure those costs. So after we measure those costs, after you create and rank those spending goals, we need to factor in those age-related spendings. Now we can start comparing with kind of step one in that retirement pre-approval. You know, are they matching up? Is the sustainable spending amount that we're looking at pretty consistent with the lifestyle that you have? You know, if you have some cutback risk, you know, how severe is that going to be? Is it just going to be in the wish category, which is the most discretionary? Or are your needs potentially at risk? Obviously, if the needs are at risk, don't pass go. Let's go back. Probably going to have to work longer save a little bit more so on and so forth. But these are the starting points and kind of the foundational pieces to your financial plan and the Retire Smarter Solution. In step three, we get into Social Security Expander and virtually everybody you know, has Social Security. It's possible that you, know, you may have worked in a government or state-based system where you didn't pay into Social Security, but uh, there's very few of those that are around these days. So whether it's Social Security, whether it is a pension, you know, we really want to look and try to optimize those income sources that you have. Social Security is really the only inflation adjusted income stream that people have these days. Sure, some of these state based pensions may have some cost of living adjustments, but it's not the same to the same effect that Social Security has. And one of the biggest risks when you're a retiree and you turn off your paycheck is inflation risk and preserving your lifestyle, not preserving your dollars. These are two different things, preserving your lifestyle, which entails having some growth, at least at the rate of inflation, if not higher over time. But when we look at the Social Security expander, when we look at your pension, or if you have deferred compensation and we have some flexibility, how we're gonna pull that income out from these sources, we like to start looking at that in isolation at first. We wanna make sure that we understand the key variables that are driving those decisions, Sure, their Social Security is a system and we're very familiar with that, and those variables are the same for all. Uh, however, if you do have a, a pension, we need to look at your specific pension plan and the variables that are underlying that to make sure that we're going to optimize that income stream for you as well. And you'll see the third bullet point here is really just coordinating the strategy with the tax smart distribution strategy, which we're going to talk about later. But a lot of times people are looking at Social Security and kind of being a little bit short-sighted and really how it plays into the plan. We look at it in isolation first, but then we need to fit it into your financial life plan and look at everything in totality. And that's a key point to remember. You know, All of these variables that we have coming in uh, impact one another. So while we may want to look at something first in isolation and understand the key drivers, the key variables, we need to fit it into your financial life plan relative to your lifestyle, relative to your spending goals, and make sure that we're fully understanding all the implications of it. Step four, the risk mitigator. So there's a few things. Um, I mentioned inflation, but a few other things may be coming to mind when I mention this. Again, healthcare cost. You know, mentioning not just the cost aspect, but also the transition from your employer provided healthcare coverage, you know, whether that's onto COBRA or directly onto Medicare or onto an exchange based plan if you're, you know, before 65 and before Medicare eligible. These are all different risks that people have. And also you have that long-term health care risk. So this is more sort of nursing home, assisted living, uh, memory care, that sort of risk that does you know, manifest for some people. So we have to look at that. We have to stress test your plan. Are you able to self-insure some of those long-term health care risks? Might you need to purchase insurance? If we get ourselves into a worst case and you do have to avail yourself of that long-term care for an extended period of time, is your surviving spouse likely to be okay? What's going to be left? for him or for her, you know, all those sorts of variables we're getting into. The health insurance cost um, can be quite substantial, uh, particularly before age 65 and, and Medicare eligible. But again, just fully understanding those, 
looking at your options that you have, whether it is COBRA, whether it is an individual policy, maybe you can avail yourself of a healthcare tax credit, which could be quite substantial and offset the cost of those individual policies. All very, very, very important items to go ahead and make sure that you're mitigating any risks, gaps in coverage, and making sure that you have proper insurances in place, but aren't necessarily over-insuring unless it's something that you do, in fact, intentionally want to do. And then outside of the healthcare, long-term healthcare arenas, it's really looking at your lifestyle risk. You know, we talked about having those needs and wants and wishes, those priorities on your life spending goals. You know, if you do have to cut back, maybe if we're dealt a bad hand, inflation is running rampant for longer than expected, returns are maybe lower, maybe you have unforeseen expenses, you have to help out a family member to a pretty significant extent and you didn't foresee that but you have to go ahead and help them and it's something that you want to do. If you have to make a change, you know, really stress testing, you know, your assets and having a predetermined plan as far as where you would cut back makes a lot of sense. Here we we really measure, you know, what's the required return that you need on your investment assets? How much capacity do you have for risk? Sometimes we find that people even though they're, you know, in their late 50s or 60s, they can still maintain quite a significant amount of risk because they're living quite below their means. Other times we find that, hey, you know, they need to take a certain amount of risk to have a reasonable expectation of earning that required return. But if they take too much, they're exposing themselves kind of leading with the chin. We have ways of measuring this um, statistically to go ahead and have a probability based approach to what's going to work for you in your financial life plan. Step five here, we're getting into the details. You know, so we have the framework built in the first few steps. You know, we're looking at your spending, what's important to you as a person, in your lifestyle, what you've become accustomed to and what you want to do. We're optimizing those income sources, whether it's Social Security or a pension. We're looking at the risk factors that you have for health care and just investment risk and what have you. Really figuring out how much of a return you need to earn to make your plan work and have a good probability that you won't have to cut back. And now we're getting into the more details of investments and also our tax smart distribution strategy next. And here in step five, we're really, you know, digging into those investments. We have the return estimate, you know, the required return for your goals. Is your investment allocation structured in a way to go ahead and give you a reasonable probability of meeting that? You know, we have to work through that. We have to understand it. If you need a high return and you have everything in cash, probably not going to work out or vice versa. We need to look at your investment allocation, the investments themselves, the fees that you're paying, as well as any tax costs if you're investing outside of any retirement accounts. What I like in this too is, you know, you need two things. You want good ingredients. Those are the investments themselves. And you need a good recipe in combining the ingredients. That's called the asset allocation. Candidly, uh, while both matter, science-based studies show that the recipe is actually even more important than the ingredients. But hey, Let's make sure that we have them both and both done right and both done well. And then ultimately, and this is incredibly important, none of this is done in a vacuum, as I mentioned. We really need to match back your investment allocation and your investment planning to your financial life plan. You know, if you see, it's quite common that you see, you know, when people retire, they need to go ahead and, and utilize their investments to a much higher degree than maybe later on down the road when Social Security or pensions will start. Well, if the investments have to do more work, arguably you probably have a little bit less risk capacity at that point in time. So nothing is done in a vacuum. One of the mistakes I often see commonly made is that people are looking at their investments in a vacuum and they're starting there. I love investments, I love investment planning, but it's not the place to start by and large. You need to have a purpose. You do have a purpose for the money. You've been saving this for many, many years. Sure, we like all our investments to grow, but it's not just about how many dollars we have there. It's what we can do with those dollars. It's about maintaining our lifestyle, both today, in the future, making sure that our money lasts, and making sure that we're able to do those things that are important to us and having the peace of mind to do that. So these are the details that are important. But again, it has to be matched back to the financial life plan. This is why the investments are coming later in the six step process. And then lastly, the tax mark distribution strategy. You know, these are those parts where, you know, you want to make sure that you're taking advantage of low income tax rates. Your last few years of working probably are going to be your highest tax years by and large, stereotypically, and then you retire. And now maybe you have a few different pockets of money to go ahead and pull from. 
Maybe you have a yet to be taxed account, whether it's a 401k or traditional IRA. I'm sure that you have those. You probably you may have a Roth IRA, so that money is tax free, and you may have a taxable account. These are those joint accounts, trust accounts, so on and so forth, where you get a 1099 every January, and you have to pick up income on your tax return. So there's a sort of a tax drag there. So each of these you know, has different characteristics. Each of those we can utilize to go ahead and craft a tax smart distribution strategy for you. We can we may want to go ahead and realize capital gains or realize income in these lower brackets. Maybe do conversions from IRAs over into Roth IRAs before you may get into a higher tax bracket down the road. All of these things are important. There was a tax plan that was passed in 2017, and tax rates are some of the lowest that they've been in history right now, at least over the last you know, multitude of decades. And those are in effect through 2025, 2026. We go back to what we had in 2017. So we know what taxes are now. Arguably, they're on sale. Current laws are gonna increase in 2026. So it's probably in your best interest to be mindful of this. And then if we can see that you can realize some income in a lower tax bracket today and avoid a higher tax bracket in the future, well, you're making good money from just proper planning there. And if you do that consistently, again, studies will show that you'll be able to make your money last at least a few years longer compared to not having a tax smart distribution strategy. So that's it. That's the six step process that we always go through. It just makes sense to do these sorts of things and make sure that things are not being missed. It helps go ahead and bring the myriad details of your financial life, regardless of how complex it may be, into a framework that will make sure that everything is well aligned, your investments are designed to support your lifestyle, and we're overlaying that with a tax mark distribution strategy, and always keeping our eye on the ball and trying to keep you on track. If this sounds like something that you are interested in pursuing, we only need a few pieces of information you can see some information here on the screen, retirement statements, Social Security, and we can estimate that quite frankly, just based on some income numbers. But if you have it, that's even better. Certainly investment statements, tax returns, not required, but certainly helpful if we're gonna do a good job. And it's really looking at kind of running these diagnostics to analyze your financial situation. You know, it's not necessarily going in and doing the financial surgery, but it's getting the MRI, it's getting some of the consultations done. It's really doing the diagnostic part to go over this sort of framework and then walk you through the Retire Smarter solution. It's a pretty nominal investment to go through. It's only a couple thousand dollars. It's not overly expensive to go ahead and get that clarity, get that confidence, and get the peace of mind that you need to make sure that you're making the most out of what you have. If you'd like to learn more, if you'd like to have a conversation, please reach out to us. Phone number is just 855-TWD-PLAN. You can visit our website, truewealthdesign.com, or send us an email. We look forward to talking with you.